Hi, Will Duvall here, lead pastor of West Hills Church, and on behalf of all of us at West Hills, I just want to thank you for watching this sermon online. If you're watching this, you're likely one of two people. Either you belong at West Hills already, or you're checking us out for the first time. And so let me address both those. First of all, if you're a West Hillian, uh, just a reminder, this is no replacement for being with the gathered church on Sunday morning. And similarly, even if you're new, I hope that this sermon gives you a taste of who we are. But I'll just encourage you too. there's no replacement for uh, being with the gathered church and, and worshiping together, fellowshipping together, sharing the Lord's Supper together, that Sunday morning experience that we can't replicate here online. So for both of you, I want to encourage you to come join us this Sunday at 1030. Uh, we'll hope to see you there. Good morning, church. Uh, as uh, Pastor Will mentioned, my name is Thad Yessa. I'm the new pastor of Youth and Connections, and it is a, a great privilege to open God's Word with you uh, this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 12. We'll be continuing our study this morning through uh, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, before we turn to that text, uh, I thought it was interesting as I was reading over this passage and came to the conclusion that humans are inclined to ask really big questions. We want to know questions, uh, answers to questions like, who is the greatest president? Is it Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt, Reagan? You may have a different opinion. Who is the greatest football player of all time? Jerry Rice, Joe Montana, Walter, pa Walter Payton. Uh, the list goes on. You know, what is the safest car seat for my child? What is the best car for my family? What is the best book I can read? What is the best movie that I can watch? And this isn't actually something that's unique to our Western culture. In fact, for all of humanity, mankind has been asking big questions. This even goes back to the time of Jesus when religious people would come and they would ask Jesus questions like, what is the most important commandment of all? And what is unique about that is Jesus doesn't just have one answer for them like any of those other questions that I asked before, but in fact, he gives them two and how we respond to these two commandments that Jesus gives us in the scriptures exposes our hearts and lays bare our souls. It truly reveals what matters most to us. It answers the question of what do we cherish most? What is that item in my life that I hold with supreme value? So as you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. We are in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, he asked, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he, God, is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all your heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than, all, than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered him wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Let's pray and ask for God's help this morning. Our Father, we, we come to you as broken people, people who are easily distracted by the things of this world, 
the difficulties that we face this week, problems with family members, difficulties at work. Father, we pray that you would help us to put aside those distractions, the ones that Satan would love to occupy our mind during the preaching of God's word. We pray that your spirit would move in us to give us understanding of the text and help us to grow in our sanctification in order to be more like Jesus. We pray all of this in your precious son's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you're one of those people who likes main ideas uh, from the get-go, I will go ahead and give you the main idea today. Citizens of Christ's kingdom are called to love God supremely and to love their neighbors genuinely. We are commanded to love God supremely. A scribe, and if you don't know what a scribe is, it's a religious lawyer, comes to Jesus. He was in the vicinity of Jesus. If you recall what's going on around this time is different religious leaders at the time are coming to Jesus and they're asking him questions. They're trying to trip him up. They're trying to give reason that they can get rid of him. And this scribe, he, he's there and he overhears how wisely Jesus is answering all of these questions. And so he decides that he's going to throw his question into the mix. He comes to Jesus and he goes, hey, what is the most important commandment of all? Now, this may seem like a really basic, straightforward question to us, but if we actually go back and look at the history of the commandments and the traditions of the Jewish culture at that time, we'd come to find out that there are 613 commands in the first five books of the Bible. Of these commands, there are 365 that were negative and 248 that were positive. Some of these are light and wouldn't be too difficult to follow. Others were viewed as very heavy and had severe repercussions for those who would disobey them. So the scribe asked Jesus to add his opinion. I'm sure this was a heavily debated topic among the theologians at the time. And Jesus, in a way that only he can, obliges him and answers him and takes us to the core of what really matters in our life, that we love God supremely. And he goes on to do something really amazing, is instead of giving some remarkable new insight to the question the scribe is asking, he in fact gives him very old insight which points to the fact that we are to love God for who he is. Instead of coming up with some great new tweetable idea that could sell a best-selling book, he takes them back to the first five books that the scribe was very familiar with. He takes them to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, and says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. So instead of giving new insight, Jesus says, hey, you already have the answer to this. This confession that Jesus just gives us from Deuteronomy is something that any devout Jewish person would say every single day at the beginning of the day. Jonathan Edwards, the theologian, explains this verse, this statement, it was and is as important to Judaism as the Lord's Prayer is to Christianity. Those verses are the heart and soul of the Hebrew faith. In fact, they're even the heart and soul of Christianity. That God is the one and only true God. And that God is a covenant or promise-keeping God that he is unified and unique in essence and existence, that he alone is God and that there is no one, nothing else that is like him. And this is the God whom we've come to worship this morning. These verses are a powerful statement about God's uniqueness and his exclusivity. Our God is God alone, and this God demands our worship, love, devotion, and allegiance. 
It must be exclusively to him or he will not accept it. This points a finger actually to what is fundamentally wrong with us. The fact that we're all broken people. In fact, God intended from the very beginning of time when he spoke the world and the universe into existence. He intended for us to worship him and him alone. When he created the world, he created the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, he made Adam and Eve, who were his only creation that were meant to worship him. They were given uniqueness, made in the likeness of God, able to worship God in ways that animal, trees, and the surrounding area were not able to. Mankind, though, if you're familiar with the story of the Bible, quickly is deceived by Satan. He comes along and says, hey, I know God said that he created everything perfect for you and he gave you everything that you could have ever wanted. But he says, what about that one tree that he said you can't eat of? And in a moment of disobedience where they were not worshiping God with all their being, Adam and Eve decided that at that point they were going to become worshipers of self. Now teachers and theologians of the time could debate all that they wanted to about what the most important commandment was. But Jesus begins by bringing them back to the basics, the non-negotiables of the faith. That we should love this God, the one who created all things, who is sovereign over all things, is the one who should be loved because he is the God over all things. Now you may think, okay, you say that this God created all things, but I don't see him. I can't have a conversation with him. Just this ancient book that describes him. What is he really like? Well, Exodus 34 verses 5 through 7 give us a glimpse into what he is like. It says, The Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there, being Moses, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord a God, is merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgressions and sins, but who will by no means clear a guilty conscience. And this describes him as being perfect and being gracious, loving, pure, a lover of justice, all the things that our raging world desires, justice. And this is who this God is. Now, what does it mean to obey God, to love God? To love God is to obey his commandments and statutes. So in Deuteronomy chapter six, in the context that this verse that Jesus gives as a what is the greatest commandment, he gives us examples of what this is. To love God means that you will teach these commandments to your children and grandchildren, Deuteronomy 6.2. When you sit, walk, lie down, rise up throughout the day, you will remember that he is God. And for the Israelites in Deuteronomy 6.12, that he is the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. To love God supremely means that you must not follow other gods, other gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 6, 14 through 15. This God is a God whom we should love because of who he is. He is everything that we desire but cannot be. Perfect, holy, gracious, loving, a just God. But we are also to love God with all you are. And the repetition in Mark chapter 12 of all four times is meant to emphasize the comprehensive nature of how we are to love God. It calls for a total response of love and devotion. It calls to love God wholly and completely. 
Kent Hughes, a former pastor and now a seminary professor, says this, God is never satisfied with anything less than the devotion of our whole life for the whole duration of our life. Meaning that we need to love God with everything that we have for our whole entire lives. To illustrate this, we could think of uh, young love. So picture with me a young couple who has just gotten married. And the husband is one who deeply loves his life. They're in that honeymoon phase where everything is good, nothing has gone wrong, they had a great honeymoon together, they've come back from that. And the questions we could ask is, is, picture me as the husband, is my wife the all-consuming passion of my life? Do I have deep, intense, abiding affection for my wife? Am I loyal to my wife with an exclusive love? Do I resist and even oppose anything or anyone that seeks to do my wife harm? Am I zealous to defend my wife with grace and honor? Do I enjoy spending time with my wife? Do I do these things to please my wife and increase her joy? Do I brag about my wife to others? Do I tell my wife that I love her? Do I talk with my wife as much as I can? Now that seems like a really great list of someone who really loves their wife with their whole being. But I think to put that in perspective is we need to change those questions. If we're to love God with our whole being, the question should be, is God the all-consuming passion of my life? Do I have a deep, intense, and abiding affection for my God? Am I loyal to my God with an exclusive love? Do I resist and oppose anything or anyone that would seek to do my God harm? Am I zealous to defend with grace my God's name and honor? Do I enjoy spending time with my God? Do I do these things that please my God and increase his joy? Do I brag about my God to others? Do I tell my God that I love him? Do I talk with my God as much as I can? Now I say those and you might be thinking, how is that even possible? Well, the reality is it's not possible in our own strength because in our hearts we are inherently wicked. And we need to remember that these are not things that I do to get God's love. We don't come to church to get God's love. We don't read our Bibles to get God's love. We don't sing great songs to get God's love. The things that I just mentioned are things that we do because we are loved by him and because we love him. We love God because he first loved us, 1 John 4.10. And in fact, God loves us despite the lack of my total and incomplete love and affection. Meaning that even when I fail, and to be honest with you, I fail quite often, God still loves me despite the fact of my failure. God's love is steadfast and continuing. It doesn't change just because I disobeyed him. In fact, God demonstrated all of this by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. Not because Jesus was being punished for wrongs that he had done, but because he's being punished for wrongs that I had done, wrongs that you had done. As often is the case, Jesus gives us much more than we ask for in the scriptures. The religious lawyer asks, what's the most important? And Jesus starts with, the most important is that you love God with all that you are. But then Jesus tells him that, in fact, it's not just one, but it's two that are so intertwined they can't be separated. And how you respond to the first one, loving God with all determination, will affect how you respond to the second one of loving your neighbor as yourself. When you obey the second commandment, it shows, in fact, that you have embraced the first commandment. We are commanded to love others genuinely. 
what does this look like? Well, if we're having a conversation or we have a relationship in some way, if you want to prove that you love me, you will show your love to me by how you love my daughters. Why? Because I love my two little girls more than anything in this world. So if you truly love me, if you truly care about me, if you want to show me that you care about me, you will, in fact, care for Reagan and Margot. But in contrast, you can claim to feel whatever it is about me. You can say whatever you want about me. But if you treat my daughters poorly, you, in fact, prove that you really don't get me and that you really don't love me and that you really don't care about me at all. Tim Keller says this. Jesus shows us that love actually defines the lawful life. And he shows us that the law actually defines the loving life. When Jesus says all the law boils down to love God and neighbor, he's saying we have not fulfilled the law simply by avoiding that which the law prohibits. But we must also do and be what the law is really after, namely love. This kind of love, this genuine love for one's neighbor is legitimately selfless. It's not something that you can just do on the side or out of habit. So Jesus adds, like he did Deuteronomy 6 as the greatest commandment. He complements that with Leviticus 19, verse 18. Saying, growing out of my love for God, it means that I love those whom have been created by God and whom are created in his image. Neighbor here is not viewed in a restrictive sense, meaning the person who lives next door to me or across the street from me or who sits next to me in the pew or in the chairs. In fact, it's an all-inclusive term referring to every single human being on the earth, meaning those who are like us, those who are not like us, those who cheer for the same sports teams as us, those who cheer for our rivals in those sports, those who have the same economic status as us, those who don't, the rich, the poor, the educated, the uneducated. It includes all people. What does it mean to care for our neighbor, to love our neighbor as ourselves? Well, I'm sure you can think about, okay, what does it mean to love myself? It means that my needs are met, my desires are fulfilled, my cravings are filled. Anything I want, I get. I'm taken care of. I don't have cares in the world about that. But Jesus, the ultimate act of selflessness through his work on the cross says, hey, take all those self-desires and care for others as much as you care for yourself. You may be thinking, how is it even possible to care for another human being as much as I care for myself? Like, I can care for my spouse because I love my spouse. I can care for my children because I love my children. But how am I going to care for my boss who treats me poorly the same way that I care about myself? Well, to be honest, it's actually not possible in your own strength. Only by loving God supremely will you be able to love others all others, regardless of who they are to us, genuinely. So not just those in our friend group, not those who look like us, not those who go to the same school as us, etc. All people. We remember who the gospel is for. The gospel is for all people. And as we love others this way, we demonstrate that we love God supremely. Practically, what does this look like? Well, we could look back at Leviticus 19 and see the command to love one's neighbor where that is found. It says in that passage that we are to care for the poor, verse 1910. 
Not steal, not lie, 1911. Be fair in business dealings. Care for the deaf, care for the blind. Deal justly with all. Avoid slander. Don't jeopardize the life of your neighbor. Don't harbor hatred against your brother. Rebuke your neighbor when necessary for his good and yours. Don't take revenge or bear grudges against other. All of this is found right before God's command to love one's neighbor as yourself. God does not leave it up to our own imagination to figure out what he means when he tells us to love our neighbor. But even more than that, Jesus says in John 13, verses 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The greatest act of love that we can show to one another is not being a genuinely good person like Leviticus 19 summarizes, not stealing, being kind, not holding grudges. But in fact, the greatest act of love that we can show anyone is by showing them the one who first loved us, and that's Jesus. These two commandments to love God and to love our neighbor are intertwined and they have vertical responses and horizontal implications. They encapsulate what the Great Commission is all about. Those who love God, who have been redeemed by Jesus, have a mission to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And how do we go and make disciples of all nations? By telling them and showing them the love of Jesus that we ourselves have experienced. The greatest gift that anyone can ever receive is a right relationship with God because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And we have been changed and we have been made new creatures because Jesus took everything that was wrong with us and said, I'm going to bear this punishment on the cross. So when God looks down at you, if you have faith in Jesus, that instead of seeing your wickedness, your burdens, your brokenness, he will see Jesus' righteousness. Such love is a true sacrifice. Mark chapter 12, verses 32 through 34, or through 33, reads this. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said he is one. There is no one beside him. And to love him with all your heart and with all understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than a whole burnt offering and sacrifices. The scribe is really excited with how Jesus responds to this. With much delight, he reaffirms what Jesus said, that there is one God who is deserving of all of our love and all of our affection. And he even affirms the importance of loving one's neighbor. And Jesus even gives him a verbal applause to the summary to love God supremely and to love our neighbors genuinely is far more important than religious activities such as sacrifices, fasting, and prayers. The scribe says this. It's more important than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Real religion is ultimately a matter of the heart. Religious rituals must give way to the superiority of a right relationship with God and others. Indeed, rituals have no real meaning unless they are an expression of our love for Jesus and others. Meaning, we can come to church every time the doors are open. We can read through the Bible in a year. We can pray for hours every day. But if we do all of those things disconnected from Jesus, they mean nothing. <laughs> And such a love as this is crucial to our salvation. After Jesus applauds the scribe on his affirmation of what Jesus says, the hammer actually drops. 
And he says, Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, what Jesus did not mean by this is that you are so close to the kingdom of God that if you just try harder, work more, you're going to get there. Rather, the man has to come and see that entering the kingdom of God is a matter of heart devotion and not hard duty. Obeying rules and regulations is exhausting. And more importantly, we'll never get you or me into the kingdom of God because we can never measure up to God's standard, which is that of perfection. Instead, I need a new me. I need a new heart that's not wicked. I need the grace and the mercy of my God who can make me a new creation because of Jesus' death on the cross. We cannot love God until we have been changed by the gospel of Jesus and been brought into the kingdom and near to God. One draws near and enters the kingdom not by religious acts, but simply by faith in Jesus and his work on the cross. A relationship that results in us loving God supremely because God showed the greatest act of love by sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. And as a result, we are changed and genuinely want to love others with that same love Jesus showed us. The cross of Jesus tells us that Jesus loves God supremely. And it tells us that Jesus loves us genuinely. Which is why the Holy Spirit moved John, the author, to write this in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Because, our beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love... Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Meaning that in our lives, we are to be so radically changed by the gospel, by what Jesus has done for us, that our only response to this passage that Jesus died for us, for our sins, the only appropriate response is that we love God with our whole beings. And we do the commandments of scriptures not to earn that love, but because we love him. And as a result, we will love those whom God has loved and God has loved all. And that is why he sent Jesus to die for us. To love God is to love others. To love others is to love God. These are two great commandments and they give us two great loves. Let us close in prayer.